All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here's the list of topics to be covered in this video. All right, problem one. Suppose f of x is equal to negative 2x squared plus 8x minus 2, a is equal to negative 3, and b is equal to 1. First, we're asked to compute f of a plus f of b. Well, since a is equal to negative 3, f of a is f of negative 3. Now, f of x is negative 2x squared plus 8x minus 2, so f of a is negative 2 times negative 3 squared plus 8 times negative 3 minus 2, which, after a bunch of computation, resolves down to negative 44 f of b similarly will be f of 1 because b is equal to 1. We plug 1 into f of x and we get negative 2 times 1 squared plus 8 times 1 minus 2 simplifies down to 4. So having computed f of a to be negative 44 and f of b to be 4, we say that f of a plus f of b is negative 44 plus 4, which is negative 40. And similarly, f of a minus f of b, well, we've already computed f of a to be negative 44 and f of b to be 4, so the difference is negative 48. Problem 2. Let's solve using the quadratic formula negative 8x squared plus 6x plus 2 should be equal to 0. So we identify that the coefficient of our quadratic term is negative 8, x squared is being multiplied by negative 8, the coefficient of our linear term is 6, x is being multiplied by 6, and our constant term is 2. And in the quadratic formula, these are usually represented respectively as little a, b, and c. And then the quadratic formula is that as long as you have a quadratic set equal to 0, you solve for x as negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. With our quantities b equals 6, a equals negative 8, and c equals 2, we plug all of those things in. Under this radical, we have 6 squared minus 4 times negative 8 times 2. That becomes 36 plus 64, which is 100. The square root of 100 is 10, a nice even integer, that's great. So we have negative 6 plus or minus 10 over negative 16. I'm going to go ahead and cancel a minus sign, meaning I'm going to factor a negative 1 out of the numerator and factor a negative 1 out of the denominator, then cancel them. There is actually what's called a minus plus sign. It doesn't really matter between plus minus and minus plus if it's the only sign in there, but if you actually have an equation where there's several of them scattered about, a minus plus just means it has to be the opposite of whatever you chose in the plus minus. But anyway, we have 6 minus 10 over 16 or 6 plus 10 over 16. This gives us two values of x to be negative 1 quarter or 1. Next up, find all real solutions by completing the square. We have x squared minus 4x plus 2 is equal to 23. The first step in completing the square, having got the quadratic, the squared term, and the linear, just the x term, on one side of the equation, you need to identify the leading coefficient, the number multiplying x squared. If it's not equal to 1, you're going to have to factor it out, but just out of the quadratic and linear term. We have a leading coefficient of 1, which means factoring out a 1 isn't going to change anything. Next, identify your linear coefficient and find 1 half of that. So our linear term, our x, is being multiplied by negative 4, and half of that is negative 2. Complete the square, which will involve subtracting the square of 1 half the linear coefficient. So we had x squared minus 4x. Now, if we were to FOIL out x minus 2 squared, we would get that x squared, we would get the minus 4x, but we would get a plus negative 2 squared, which we cancel out by subtracting negative 2 squared. And we, ha we already had the plus 2 hanging out and the 23 on the right. Now we just need to isolate the squared term on one side. Okay, so that negative 2 squared is 4. We have negative 4 plus 2. We're going to move those other to the other side by a plus 4 and a minus 2. So now we have x minus 2 squared isolated by itself, and it's set equal to 25. Finally, we can use square roots to solve. If x minus 2 squared is 25, x minus 2 is plus or minus the square root of 25, aka plus or minus 5. This ultimately solves down to either x is 7 or x is 3. In problem four, we're asked to factor the polynomial 10x squared plus 33x plus 20. Now here's something very important. We are told the answer can be written as ax plus b times cx plus d, where all of those are integers. Now I want to warn us as we get into this, we're really going to go deep into this one. You could get this problem probably faster than we will just by doing some guessing and checking with what you choose a, b, c, and d to be, but I really want to reason it out. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, 
since we know the answer will eventually look like ax plus b times cx plus d is just distribute out what we know the answer will look like. At the far right, we find that our x squared term will eventually have coefficient a times c, our linear term x will have coefficient ad plus bc, and our constant term will be bd. Now if I compare that to what the polynomial should be equal to, our coefficient on our quadratic term, AC, should be equal to 10, the coefficient on our linear term, AD plus BC, should be 33, and the coefficient on our constant term, BD, should be 20. So what we have to do is find A, B, C, and D to solve those three equations, A times C equals 10, AD plus BC equals 33, and B times D equals 20. We're going to start off by trying to figure out which of these numbers should be positive versus negative. Let's look first at a times c equals positive 10, means a and c must both be positive or possibly both be negative. So a and c have the same sign. They're either both positive or they're both negative. Similarly, b and d must either both be positive or possibly both negative because they multiply to positive 20. Now suppose I pick AC to be positive and BD to both be negative or vice versa. So one of these pairs are both positive and the other pair is both negative. Now look at that linear term AD plus BC. Well if A and C are both positive and D and B are both negative, then A times D is negative and B times C is negative and then their sum would still be negative, but it shouldn't be, it should be 33. So I cannot have one pair positive and one pair negative meaning either both pairs are positive, meaning all terms are positive, or maybe both pairs are negative, meaning every single number will be negative at the end of the day. But what if A, B, C, and D were all negative? Now we have this parenthetical term in our final answer, AX plus B. If A and B are both negative, I could factor a negative one out, transform them both into positive numbers. And if C, D were both negative, I could do the same thing there. Then I'd have factored a negative one out twice and I can multiply those together and get a one. In other words, if they were all negative, by factoring a negative one out twice, I could have just pretended they were all positive. So we may as well assume that they were all positive to start with. So A, B, C, and D are not just all integers, they are all positive integers. We have some extra information now. So we've determined that A times C should be 10, A, D plus B, C should be 33, and B, D should be 20, and they should all be positive, or possibly all negative. Okay, there's not a unique solution, but we're going to go with the positive one. So a times C are two positive integers that multiply to 10. Either they are 1 and 10, or they are 2 and 5. I am not saying that A is 1 and C is 10. It could be the other way. A is 10 and C is 1. As a pair, the pair of them is either 1 and 10, or possibly 2 and 5. Similarly, B times D should be 20, and we've gone ahead and presumed them to be positive. So either the pair is 1 times 20, 2 times 10, or 4 times 5. But again, I don't know which is which. Even if I somehow narrowed it down that I know BD as a pair is 4 and 5, I don't know which is which. Having isolated positive versus negative information, the next thing I'm going to do is look at what could possibly be even versus odd. This isn't always going to be helpful, but look at that linear term AD plus BC equals 33. 33 is an odd number. So AD and BC cannot both be even. Otherwise, AD plus BC would be the sum of two even numbers, and that would be even. So B and D cannot both be even. If B was even, then BC would be even. And if D were even, then AD would be even. And we've just established they can't both make even numbers, those pairs. So between the pair B and D, they cannot both be even numbers, and that rules out the possible pair 2 and 10. Even though I never knew which was which, I know that pair cannot work. If B and D were both even, then AD plus BC would be even, and it's not. It's 33. So AC as a pair could be 1 and 10 or 2 and 5. Again, I don't know in what order. And BD could be the pair 1 and 20 or the pair 4 and 5. Notice that each pair has an even and an odd. Since AD plus BC is 33, that's an odd number. Between the numbers AD and BC, I need one of those to be even and one of them to be odd. Just like before we argued they can't both be even, they also can't both be odd or their sum would be even. So AD and BC between those two things must be an even number and an odd number. What that tells us 
is in one pair of AC or BD. I know there's an odd and I know there's an even. The odd has to multiply against the other odd and the even has to multiply against the other even. If they were cross-matched and you had odds multiplying evens, an odd times an even is even and then both AD and BC would be even and they can't both be. So if I pick a pair 1 comma 10 or 2 comma 5, if I pick a pair 1 comma 20 or 4 comma 5, in the expression AD plus BC, I have to have the odds multiplying each other and the evens multiplying each other. That way I'll get an odd and an even and their sum could possibly be 33. So we've established AC must be 10, AD plus BC must be 33, BD must be 20. Either they're all positive or they're all negative. We're going with the solution where they're all going to be positive. We have a few possible pairs. As a pair, A and C might be 1 and 10 or 2 and 5. And again, I haven't narrowed down which one could be which. And the pair B and D could be 1 and 20 or possibly 4 and 5. And in each of these possible pairings, the odd has to multiply the odd and the even multiply the even in the expression AD plus BC. So to elaborate on this point further, because it's potentially confusing, suppose you have the two pairs 1, 10 and 4, 5. If A is chosen to be 10, the even one, then in the expression AD plus BC, A is multiplying D. I picked A to be even. I have to pick D to be the even number out of its pair, 4. If I were to switch A with C, but also switch B with D, in effect, you're simply reversing your two parenthetical terms left to right. So between A and C, I could switch them and switch BD and not really change anything. So I'm going to assume that out of the pair AC, I happen to put the smaller one as A. That's just going to cut down on the number of choices. I want to point out that we can presume A is the smaller between A and C, but I cannot then presume the same thing about B and D. One of these two pairs I can go ahead and force this on, but when you do this little trick of saying if I switched AC and BD I didn't really change anything, you have to switch both. So I can assume one of the pairs is smaller and then bigger, but the other one I don't have any information about. So here's where we are so far. A times C is 10, AD plus BC is 33, BD is 20. They're either all positive and all negative. We're going to go with the positive one. We've gone ahead and narrowed down our list of possibilities by assuming that between A and C, A is less than or equal to C, which means either A is 1 and C is 10, or A is 2 and C is 5. This little assumption of saying A has to be less than or equal to C lets us impose an order on the pair A and C, 1, 10, or 2, 5, in that order. Then we have possible pairings of B and D, 1, 20, 4, 5, but we don't know what order they go in. We weren't able to enforce that kind of ordering on B and D as well. We do know, however, that in each of the pairs we pick, whichever one is even has to multiply the even number from the other pair, and whichever is odd has to multiply the odd number from the other pair in the expression A times D plus B times C equals 33. That's the only way that that expression would end up with one odd number and one even number so that the sum could be odd. 33. So for example, if I pick A equals 1 and C equals 10, and I pick the pair 120 for BD, well in the expression AD plus BC, A is multiplying D. A was odd, so I have to pick D to be the odd number from that pair 1, in which case B is 20. But in that case, AD plus BC, you can compute it, it turns out to be 201. It is definitely not 33. Well, what if A is 1 and C is 10, but instead of the pair 120, I pick the pair 4, 5 for BD. A is 1 is odd, so the number it multiplies in the linear term must also be odd, meaning D is 5 and B is 4. But in this case, AD plus BC, again, it's not 33. So we've totally ruled out the pair 110 for A and C. What about the pair 2, 5? Let's suppose A is 2, C is 5, A is now even, which means the number it multiplies in the linear term, D, must also be even. So out of the pair 120 as a possibility, D must be 20 and B must be 1, but then I don't get 33. Well, what if I pick A is 2, C is 5, B, D is the pair 4, 5. Since A is multiplying D in the linear term and A is 2, which is even, then D must be the even element of this pair, which is 4, in which case we do actually get 33. So by picking A equals 2, C equals 5, D equals 4, and B equals 5, we get AC equals 10, AD plus BC equals 33, and BD equals 20. 
So we have a solution. A is 2, B is 5, C is 5, D is 4. That's what we finally worked out. I want to stress this is not the only possible solution to this problem. Remember that we can replace all of these with negative numbers. If you replace A with negative 2, B with negative 5, C with negative 5, D with negative 4, it will work. You will get a solution. Here's a nice example. AX plus B times CX plus D is the same thing as 1 times that, but 1 is negative 1 squared. I'm then going to take that negative 1 squared and separate it into two factors of negative 1 and distribute one of them into each of the parenthetical terms. Notice that AX plus B times CX plus D is now the same thing as minus AX minus B times minus CX minus D. If you swap all of them to be multiplied by minus 1, they're all positive, goes to all negative, or vice versa, it's the same thing. So multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything, but 1 is negative 1 squared. This was why earlier we were able to say, let's just assume they're all positive. There are even more answers, however, if we drop the requirement that a, b, c, and d be integers. And we're still going to get the polynomial 10x squared plus 33x plus 20, by the way, with non-integer choices for a, b, c, and d. In fact, there are infinitely many answers. Pick any real number you want except 0, 12, 8.2, negative pi squared over 247 times the square root of 28. I don't care. Any number that is not 0. Well, that number alpha times 1 over alpha will be 1. Here's why alpha couldn't be 0, because I need to consider 1 over it. So if you have a solution, ax plus b times cx plus d, that's the same thing as it times 1. 1 is the same thing as alpha times 1 over alpha, and I distribute an alpha into one term and the 1 over alpha into the other. Notice that if ax plus b times cx plus d is equal to something, it's the same thing as this new expression we have, and we have changed all the coefficients. And I can pick alpha to be whatever I want other than zero. There are infinitely many answers as long as you're allowed to have non-integer solutions here. With integer solutions, there were two possible solutions. I would say we found the nicest possible choice of a, b, c, and d, but it's definitely not the only one. Next, let's factor x squared plus 11x plus 28. Again, there are infinitely many ways to factor this, just as in problem four, but there is one, quote, nicest, end quote, kind of way to do it. Okay, so we're just going to try to find one way to do it. If we set it equal to ax plus b times cx plus d, like in the previous problem, we would need a times c to be the quadratic coefficient 1, ad plus bc to be that linear term 11, and b times d to be 28. We want a times c to be equal to 1. Now, in this problem, we have no pre-given information that they're all going to work out to be integers. But if I want two numbers to multiply by 1, I'm just going to hope that they're both 1. Okay? I don't know this for a fact, but let's just hope. We're going to cross our fingers and say a is 1 and c is 1. That actually gives us information in that linear term. If a and c are both 1, I just get d plus b equals 11. So I'm looking for two numbers, b and d, that multiply to 28 and add to 11. Okay, And if we were in the best of all possible worlds, everything work would work out to be just integers all the time. So we want factors of 28, b times d equals 28, to add to 11. There aren't that many factors of 28. We're going to be able to figure this out. And I want to point out, when the leading coefficient of your quadratic is 1, if the solution is going to be all integers, this is essentially what it boils down to. What way to factor the constant term if you add those factors together gives you the linear coefficient. But it's very specific to have a quadratic whose leading coefficient is 1. Then this will work out. Well, there aren't that many factorizations of 28, just 1 times 28, 2 times 14, or 4 times 7. Now I just ask, of these, which pair can I pick that will add to 11? It's just 4 and 7. So this factors as ax plus b times cx plus d. We presumed that the, the coefficients on x were both 1, and then we were able to find a choice for those two constants to be 4 and 7 so that it would all work out. Problem 6, let's factor 49x squared minus 16. Well, if we presume it's going to work out like the other ones have, then we need a times c to be 49, ad plus bc to be 0. Notice that there is no term here with a linear x, so the linear coefficient should be 0, and b times d to be negative 16. 
Well, since AD plus BC is zero, AD must be negative BC. So AD and negative BC are exactly the same number, meaning they have the same prime factors if they are integers. So since AC is equal to 49, the only way to factor that is as a 149 or a seven and a seven. If one of A and C happened to be 49 or negative 49, whatever, then in the expression AD equals negative BC, one side would be divisible by 49. If A was 49, it'd be the term on the left, and if C were 49, it'd be the term on the right. But if between A and C you have a 49, then in this expression AD equals negative BC, one of those sides is divisible by 49. But therefore the other side has to be as well because they are equal, they are the same number. But if I had the pair between A and C to be one and 49, I know that the one isn't divisible by 49, which means that if AD equals negative BC and both sides are divisible by 49, if A is one, then the 49 has to be able to be factored out of D. Okay, so whatever I pick to be 49 and the other to be one between the numbers A and C, this imposes that in the term B and D, there has to be something divisible by 49. But B times D is supposed to be negative 16, so neither of those can be divisible by 49. In other words, between A and C, I cannot pick 1 and 49, or negative 1 and negative 49, I have to pick 7 and 7, or negative 7, negative 7, but we're going to go with the positive ones. Okay, very similarly, we will derive that B times D being negative 16, I cannot pick a 1 and a 16 or a 2 and an 8. Either way, I'm going to have something divisible by 8, and then in the expression AD equals negative BC, the other side wouldn't work out. Whichever one you put the 8 or the 16 in, the other side would not have it, because we've also already established that A and C are both 7. So B and D have to both be plus or minus 4. So we've said... If we're factoring 49x squared minus 16 as ax plus b times cx plus d and hoping that it's going to work out to be integers, then a and c can both be taken to be 7, and b and d are plus or minus 4, and they have to be opposites of one another so that their product is negative 16. So it doesn't really matter which way we pick b and d to be positive or negative. One of these terms is going to be 7x plus 4, and the other is going to be 7x minus 4. Observe that all we've really done is a difference of two squares factoring. A squared minus B squared is factorable as A plus B times A minus B. This is a nice thing to remember. If you foil out that term on the right, you're going to end up with A squared minus B squared. And we happened to have 49X squared minus 16, in other words, 7X squared minus 4 squared. So since we have 7X squared minus 4 squared, if I make that my A and B in A squared minus B squared, we get A plus B times A minus B, 7X plus 4 times 7X minus 4. Okay, but I went through all of the work to get here just to show that even if you do not recognize this as a difference of two squares and use the quick trick, if you are persistent and capable, you can still figure it out. Next up, let's put the equation y equals x squared minus 12x plus 35 into vertex form for a parabola. In other words, we want y to be equal to x minus h as a quantity squared plus some constant k. In other words, we need to complete the square. So first we want to factor the leading coefficient out of the quadratic and linear terms if necessary, but we see that our quadratic term x squared has leading coefficient one, so there's no factoring to do here. Next, we want to compute one half the, li the linear coefficient. The linear coefficient is negative 12, one half that is negative six. Then we complete the square, subtracting the square of one half the linear coefficient. So instead of x squared minus 12x, we call it x minus 6 squared minus that quantity negative 6 squared, in other words, minus 36. But that plus 35 is still hanging out there. We haven't done anything to that. Then we can simplify as necessary, and we get x minus 6 squared. The negative 36 plus 35 just becomes minus 1. And observe that it is now exactly in the form asked, x minus h as a quantity squared plus k, x minus 6 squared minus 1. Next, find b and c so that the parabola y equals negative 16x squared plus bx plus c has a very specific vertex. It has vertex negative 7, 4. Well, if it was in vertex form, then y would be some constant times x minus h squared plus k, and the vertex would be at the point h comma k. 
If we were to expand that whole expression out, a times x minus h squared plus k, and collect all the like terms together, there's our x minus h squared. Distribute that whole thing out to get x squared minus 2xh plus h squared. Distribute out your a and then collect your constants with each other. Then we compare it to our desired form of negative 16x squared plus bx plus c. a, the coefficient on the quadratic term, has to be negative 16. That is forced. There is nothing to do there. b, the coefficient on our linear term, has to be negative 2ah. But observe, we know that a is negative 16, so b is equal to 32h. And c must be ah squared plus k, but again, we know a is negative 16. That gives us information. And we were given that the vertex was negative 7 comma 4, h comma k. So h is negative 7 and k is 4. So we still know that capital A is negative 16, but now replacing h is negative 7 and k is 4 into our knowledge that b is 32h and c is negative 16h squared plus k, we just have some computation to do and we see that b should be equal to negative 224 and c should be equal to negative 780. Next up, sketch the graph of y equals x plus 3 squared minus 1. The vertex is at negative 3 comma negative 1. Remember that in vertex form, you have an x minus h squared plus k. So inside the parentheses, we have x minus h, meaning h is negative 3. And outside, we have a plus k, meaning k is minus 1. The vertex is at negative 3 comma negative 1. The leading coefficient is 1. That's our standard parabola. If I go right or left by one unit, it goes up 1. If I go right or left by two units, it goes up or down by four units, 2 squared. We happen to know that our leading coefficient will be positive 1, so it opens up. So here's our vertex at negative 3 comma negative 1. If I were to move right 1, it would go up 1. If I was to move right or left 2, it would go up 4. And we can just sort of join these together to get our parabola. Next, graph f of x is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 8 by identifying its correct shape, drawing the vertex, and finding an x-intercept. By shape, it just means does it open up or does it open down, and how steep is it? So all we have to do is identify the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is 1, so it opens up with its sort of typical steepness. To find the vertex, we're going to have to complete the square. And I'll point out that from this point forward, we're not going to complete the square step by step every single time. This is something that by this point in our academic careers, we should be able to reliably do on our own. So x squared minus 6x plus 8 will eventually simplify as x minus 3 squared minus 1. So the vertex is at 3 comma negative 1. Remember, you're subtracting h inside the parenthesis and then adding k outside it. So we have 3 and minus 1 for our vertex. So there's our vertex at 3 minus 1. Now, from the way it's originally formulated, x squared minus 6x plus 8, finding a y-intercept is very easy. You plug in x equals 0, and you'd get out y equals 8. However, the instructions were pretty specific, find an x-intercept. So here's our parabola. To find an x-intercept, we're going to set this equal to 0. So x minus 3 squared minus 1 should be equal to 0. The y-coordinate should be 0. Now I just need to solve this for x x minus 3 is plus or minus 1, in which case either x is 4 or x is 2. There are, in fact, two x-intercepts. So x is 4 and x is 2 are two x-intercepts. For some reason, the instruction said find an x-intercept. You end up finding both anyway, regardless of how you're going to do this. So there they are, 2, 0, and 4, 0. And now we can just sort of fill in the shape. We know it opens with standard steepness, so moving right or left by one unit will go up by one, moving right or left by two units, we'll go up four, etc. There's our parabola. Next, we are given a graph and asked to find an equation which would produce it. We can find the vertex. It's at one comma three. There it is. So f of x has to be some constant times x minus one squared plus three. We're going to work with vertex form because the vertex was very easy to spot on this parabola. The only question is, can we find a? Now, a determines the shape. So since this parabola is opening downward, we happen to know that we're looking for a negative number there, but otherwise we don't have too much information. But observe, if I move from the vertex right one unit, it goes down exactly one unit. And if I move right or left two units, it goes down exactly four units. That is our standard, typical steepness. 
where 1 goes to 1 squared and 2 goes to 2 squared and so forth. In other words, the coefficient should be plus or minus 1, and we already know it should be negative. So there we have it. f of x is negative 1 times x minus 1 squared plus 3. We don't really need to do any further work. Uh, we were not told to expand this into standard form or something, so vertex form is totally fine. Next, we are given a graph again, and we're told some specific intercepts, negative 2, 0, 3, 0, and the y-intercept is 0, 3. So we have three points on this parabola. An interesting bit of algebra, if you know three points on a parabola, you can always find its equation. Having intercepts is just a nicer way to do it. Now, in the last problem, we found the vertex, but here it does not appear to be anything terribly nice. We could find it, but it's just not worth it. There's going to be an easier way to get here. Since we know the roots are x equals negative 2 and x equals 3, this gives us two factors of x plus 2 and x minus 3 times some constant that we don't quite know. The y-intercept is what's going to tell us this constant. We happen to know that if we plug in x equals 0, we get out y equals 3. But we already know f of x is some constant a times x plus 2 times x minus 3. So plug in x equals 0 and determine that 3 is negative 6 times a. In other words, a must be negative 1 half. So there we have it. f of x is a, negative 1 half, times x plus 2 times x minus 3. Next. We've got a given quadratic function, f of x is negative 2x squared minus 4x plus 1, and we're going to have to do a bunch of stuff. First, what are the coefficients little a, little b, little c? Presumably, they're referring to the standard way of writing the quadratic formula, in which case little a refers to the quadratic coefficient, the number multiplying x squared, that's negative 2. Little b refers to the linear coefficient, the number multiplying x, that's negative 4. And little c refers to the constant term, the number that is not multiplying any x at all, and that's 1. Does the graph open up or down, and why? And we're given a bunch of options. It opens up or down because of various things. Now, the constant term c determines the intercept of the function, but is not relevant for whether it opens up or down. So we can immediately rule out the two things that said the reason is c is something. The constant term does not tell you anything about opening up or down. The leading coefficient a is negative. We have a negative 2 x squared. That tells us that it can't be because a is positive. We know a is negative, so options d and e were such and such because a is positive, but a isn't positive, those have to be wrong. And we just happen to know that a negative leading coefficient means the parabola must open down, so it doesn't open up, we only have one option left. Next, write the vertical intercept as an ordered pair. Well, the vertical intercept just means let x equal zero, so we very quickly plug in x equals zero, get out y equals one, the constant term, as mentioned already, the constant term determines the intercept. It was 1. So we have the ordered pair 0, 1. Now, can we graph the function using the vertex and one other point? So we're going to complete the square. But remember, we have a non-1 coefficient in front of our x squared term. So we'd have to factor that leading coefficient of negative 2 out of the quadratic and linear term, negative 2x squared minus 4x. Once you go ahead and do all of that, you'll end up with f of x is negative 2 times x plus 1 squared plus 3. Okay, so now we have vertex form. The vertex must be at negative 1 comma 3, which isn't quite on the bit of the you know coordinate plane that was given in this problem. I copied this from where the problem was posted, and the sort of pre-given range didn't quite include negative 1, 3, so I thought I would honor that bizarre choice. So the vertex has to be up there somewhere. We happen to know that the intercept is 0, 1, so there's our other point. And now we can just sort of draw it in, making a reasonable guess. It's opening down because the vertex is above another point, and it's got to be symmetric. So once I sort of pick what it does on the right, it does the same thing to the left. Next, consider the quadratic function f of x equals x squared minus 3x minus 10. What is the smallest x-intercept? Okay, well, we're going to factor this function. It factors as x minus 5 times x plus 2. When the factoring works out to be pretty easy, we're just going to present it. So the two x-intercepts are 5 and negative 2. What's the smallest one? Negative 2. What's the biggest one? 5. 
it's odd to me how this problem was split up into two questions of what's the smallest and the largest, when to find one of them, you're necessarily going to find the other anyway. But hey, what's the y-intercept? Well, we just have to plug in x equals 0, and the x squared and the negative 3x would vanish, and we're left with y equals negative 10. What's the vertex? So to find the vertex, we're going to have to complete the square. If you work through completing the square, you'll just end up with x minus 3 halves squared minus 49 fourths, which puts the vertex at 3 halves comma negative 49 fourths. Finally, the line of symmetry has what equation? The line of symmetry has to go through the vertex and be a vertical line. A vertical line is of the form x equals something, and it has to go through the vertex whose x coordinate is 3 halves. So the line of symmetry is just the line x equals 3 halves. So consider the quadratic function graphed below. I'd point out it's piecewise defined, and one piece, the one furthest left, appears to be quadratic. The others are straight lines. First, give the open intervals where the function is increasing. It bears pointing out that from book to book and source to source, what is considered increasing and decreasing will change. The primary difference being our constants to be considered increasing or not. Do you have to strictly go up or not to be called increasing, and similarly strictly going down or not to be called decreasing? That does change from place to place. Make sure you know the definition for your particular course. For us, we are looking for strictly going up and down, and we're definitely told to look for open intervals where this is happening. So on this interval here, we see there is a piece of the function that is definitely going up. That is between x equals minus 5 and x equals minus 3, and it's the only place the function is going up. Next, give the open intervals where the function is decreasing. Now this piece on the left, this quadratic sort of half piece here, is going down. But here we also see a linear segment that is also going down. So all the way to the left up to minus 5, that quadratic bit is going down. But between 0 and 1, we have a line going down. Finally, give the open intervals where the function is constant. We see a constant bit from negative 3 to 0, but also a constant from 1 all the way off to the right. That gives us the open intervals from negative 3 to 0 and from 1 to infinity. Next, give the domain of the function in interval notation. Well, what are the allowable x values? Check that with vertical lines. Okay, so here's a vertical line. It is an allowable value for this function. And ask, as I move left and right, which x values can be plugged in? All x values are valid. Okay, the domain is all real numbers. Now, give the range of the function. In other words, what y values can we get out? We can check that with horizontal lines. Here's a y value, a horizontal line. Does it intersect the graph? Yes, it does. How far down can I go? Only down to negative 8, which is an allowable output, that whole constant section. How far up can I go? Without bound on that quadratic bit on the left, I can keep getting larger and larger y values. So I can get out negative 8 and anything bigger. So I have the interval from negative 8, including it, all the way off to infinity. Now in problem 16, we have a demand equation. The price P in dollars that we can charge for an item is 122 minus 0.07x, where x is the number of units we produce, and our revenue R is simply given by the number of units x times the price P that we charge for them. We're asked, what are the lowest and highest price that will yield a revenue of $6,040? So we set our revenue equal to 6,040, in other words, x times p is 6,040, but p, remember, was 122 minus 0.07x. We distribute this out, and we end up with a nice quadratic. So we're going to solve for x. We need to push everything over to one side and put it in its standard order. So negative 0.07x squared plus 122 x minus 6,040 should be 0. We're just going to use the quadratic formula here. We have some big coefficients. We have some non-integer coefficients. It's not going to be something we work out by hand. Rounding off to two decimal points, 51.00 or 1,691.86. However, x is the number of units produced, so we should probably just use integers. So we're going to call this 51 and round up to 1692. But we were not asked how many units to produce. That's what x is. We were asked for a price. We are specifically asked to solve for a p, and p is 122 minus 0.07x. Using our two choices of x, we get $118.43, or $3.56. So what are the lowest and highest prices that yield a revenue of $6,040? $3.56 is the lower one, and $118.43 is the higher one. For problem 17, we're told up front 
The question is about understanding the problem, not really solving for anything. So a rocket is launched, its height h above sea level at t seconds is given by a particular quadratic here. Part A. To determine from what height was the rocket launched, we would find what? The t-intercept, the h-intercept, the t-coordinate of the vertex, or the h-coordinate of the vertex. Now the t-intercept would be solved by letting h equals 0. In other words, you would be specifying the height is 0, and you would be solving for t, the time. The h-intercept is when you set the time to be 0 and solve for the height. The vertex, t, comma, 8, gives either the maximum or minimum height at a particular time, depending on whether your parabola is opening down or up, and since this parabola is opening down, it will be a maximum. So of these options, what tells us determine from what height the rocket was launched? I want to determine a height, I want to solve for an h. It's definitely not the t-intercept, that's specifying h is equal to zero. Instead, it's setting t equal to zero. The time of launch is t equals zero. Looking at the problem description, t is seconds after launch, so the launch itself is t equals zero, that's the h-intercept. Next, to determine the maximum height reached, well, we've already said that the vertex gives us a maximum or minimum height since it's opening down because of its negative leading coefficient, we get a maximum. So that is a height coordinate of the vertex. And then to determine when the rocket splashes into the ocean, what would we find? Well, we're definitely not looking for a maximum height or when that happens. We're looking for when the height is zero. In other words, the t-intercept. Next up, the height of a ball thrown by a child is given by y equals negative 1 14th x squared plus 2x plus 3, where x is the horizontal distance in feet from the point at which the ball was thrown. Okay, how high is the ball when it leaves the child's hand? What is the maximum height of the ball, and how far from the child does the ball strike the ground, rounded off to two decimal points? Well, the ball leaves the child's hand when the distance to the child is zero, so x is given as the horizontal distance from the point at which the ball is thrown. When it's thrown, it is no distance from there. So set x equal to zero and solve that y is three. So how high was the ball when it leaves the child's hand? Three feet. Next. What is the maximum height of the ball it means we want to find the vertex. This is a fairly lengthy completing the square. Don't forget that your quadratic term has a non-1 coefficient that you're going to have to factor out. But if you complete the square, you end up with y is equal to negative 1 14th times the quantity x minus 14 squared plus 17. This tells us that the height, the y coordinate of the vertex, is 17 feet. Finally, how am I going to determine how far from the child does the ball strike the ground? Well, it strikes the ground at a height of zero, so I'm going to set y equal to zero, and I'm just going to use the quadratic formula here. Plugging all this stuff in and computing it with a calculator, we get either negative 1.42 or positive 29.43, rounded off. And we throw the ball and it moves away from us, so it's a positive distance, 29.43 is the correct response. All right, problem 19. The cost C of producing X totally cool coolers is modeled by the function C of X is 0.005X squared minus 0.25X plus 17. We're asked to find how many coolers need to be produced and sold to minimize the cost and round it off to the nearest whole number because it is a quantity of how many coolers. Well, the minimum cost is going to happen at the vertex of this cost parabola. We see its leading coefficient, 0.005, is positive. It is opening up, so the vertex will be a minimum. Okay, so we're just going to complete the square. So we need to factor that 0.005 out of the x squared and the x. Then we complete the square inside that parenthetical term. And then we can distribute some stuff out and simplify. And we see that c of x is 0.005 times the quantity x minus 25 squared plus 13.875, which gives a nice whole number of x being 25. That is the x coordinate of the vertex. That is how many coolers need to be produced to find this minimum cost. Now, part b says, what is the minimum cost? Well, that's just going to be the c coordinate of the vertex, 13.875. Now, fractions of cents may or may not be appropriate, depending on your instructor. So the correct answer might be listed as rounding this up to $13.88, but businesses definitely keep track of fractions of cents when they're doing things like figuring out what each unit costs when they're making many, many thousands of units. So whatever, it's going to vary from instructor to instructor what their sort of 
correct answer is taken to be. Problem 20. Consider the following quadratic inequality. Negative 5x squared plus 15x minus 10 is negative. The solution will be of which form? x less than a or x bigger than b, or it will be the form x is between a and b? Well, we have a parabola that is opening down, negative 5 times x squared, and we want it to be negative. So we're looking at some sort of downward opening parabola, okay, and it's we want it to be negative. So it's definitely something of the form to the left of one intercept or to the right of another. In other words, it's x less than one intercept or x bigger than the other. Okay, let's solve the inequality. So we have negative 5x squared plus 15x minus 10 should be negative. I can factor a negative 5 out on the left and then divide that out. Be careful, we divided by a negative number, so we had to flip the inequality. x squared minus 3x plus 2 factors fairly quickly as x minus 2 times x minus 1. So we want x minus 2 times x minus 1 to be positive. How can the product of two numbers be positive? Maybe they're both positive or maybe they're both negative. In other words, x minus 2 and x minus 1 should both be positive or both be negative. Now x minus 2 is positive exactly when x is larger than 2, just by adding 2 to both sides, and x minus 1 is positive exactly when x is larger than 1. So how can they both be positive when x is bigger than 2 and x is bigger than 1, meaning x is bigger than 2? If it's bigger than 2, it's also bigger than 1. How can they both be negative? Now if x is less than 1, then it's also definitely less than 2, in which case both factors are negative. So either x should be less than 1 or x should be bigger than 2. For problem 21, we have a quadratic inequality we want to solve, and we are instructed to write our answer in interval notation. So we have 3x squared plus 5x minus 2 should be negative. This can be factored in many ways, but it can be factored as 3x minus 1 times x plus 2 should be negative. We want something to be negative, so one factor should be positive and the other factor should be negative. The factor 3x minus 1 is positive exactly when x is bigger than 1 third. The factor x plus 2 is positive exactly when x is bigger than minus 2. So let's do this on a number line. Here's our number line. So our first factor we're going to put up here of 3x minus 1. It switches sign at x equals 1 third. Okay, it's negative, it's negative, then it's exactly equal to 0, and then it's positive. What about our other factor of x plus 2? At x equals minus 2, it switches from negative to positive, hitting 0 at exactly that point. So our two factors, 3x minus 1 and x plus 2, we've broken down where they're negative, where they're positive, where they're 0. So now we can multiply them together. Just remember, a negative times a negative is positive. Anything times 0 is 0. A negative times a positive is negative, and a positive times a positive is negative. And if we fill everything out, we get all of this right here. And we are asked, where is this product negative? only in between x equals minus 2 and x equals 1 third. So we want to write that in interval notation up at the top, all numbers between negative 2 and 1 third. We are not including the endpoints because at the endpoints, the product of the two factors will be 0, and we're not including 0 in our original inequality. Next up, find the domain and range of the function graph below. Observe that on the left we have a filled in dot, and on the right we have an open dot. So the domain we would find by looking at x-coordinates, and we include this x equals minus 3 at the left. And I ask, how far can I slide to the right until x equals 2? But that's not going to be included. So everything from negative 3 to 2, including the left, but not the right. If I want to present this as an inequality, we're looking for negative 3 to be less than or possibly equal to x, but x should be strictly less than 2. Next, what's the range in interval notation? Now for a range, we're looking for y values or horizontal lines. I'm going to start down here at the bottom where y is negative 5, and that will be included. Then we ask, how far up does that go? Up to the vertex, which happens at a height of 4. And the vertex is a height that is included in the parabola. So both the very bottom at y equals minus 5 and the very top at y equals 4 will be included. And if I want to present this as an inequality, we'd say negative 5 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 4, and both of those endpoints are included. Problem 23, we've got this horrendous looking graph, and we're supposed to figure out what function would give it. 
we are told in advance that it breaks up into three pieces, negative six less than or equal to x less than or equal to negative two, negative two less than x less than or equal to one, and one less than e x less than or equal to six, which we could have figured out from looking at the graph, but thankfully it was just given to us. So this leftmost piece is negative six less than or equal to x less than or equal to negative two. This middle piece is negative two less than x less than or equal to one, and the rightmost piece is the final bit, one less than x less than or equal to six. Now on the left, we have a nice constant at a height of minus one, so we're gonna go ahead and put that in for our function. And on the right, we have another constant of two. I'm just going for the easy bits first, why not? Now in the middle, we have a parabola and the vertex is right there at the bottom zero, zero, and it opens up. Moving right or left one unit seems to be moving up one unit. So the leading coefficient is positive because it opens up and it's one because we have this standard form where a right left motion of one goes up one and a right left motion of two would go up four and so forth. So we have a specific vertex and we know the leading coefficient is plus one. That just gives us one times x minus zero squared plus zero. The vertex was at zero, zero. This simplifies pretty directly as just x squared. We're gonna go ahead and fill that in and now we have our solution. Problem 24, let's consider this function. It's piecewise defined on two pieces. Compute f of zero. Well, the first line of defining f of x applies when x is less than or equal to zero. So we're going to use that left piece. Okay, and we're gonna plug zero into x plus one squared and get out a one, so f of zero is one. What's f of minus one? Well, the first line of f of x tells us what to do when x is less than or equal to zero. That's a whole left bit of the function. That is negative one is definitely less than or equal to zero. So we're gonna use the same computation and we get out f of minus one is zero. What's f of one? Well, now we're plugging in a number that is bigger than zero. So we're going to switch to the right piece of this function. In other words, we're gonna compute three x minus one and we end up with two. So f of one is equal to two. Then let's choose the correct graph of f of x. So the parabola is the left piece. The parabola x plus one squared is what we do when x is less than or equal to zero. This first graph has a line on the left and a parabola on the right, so it's wrong. Okay, every other piece has a line on the right and appears to have a parabola on the left. I recognize that in the second from the right picture, the parabola looks kind of straight, but it is a parabola, trust me. Okay, the parabola bit, however, the x plus one squared applies when x is zero. It is computed as x plus one squared when x is less than or equal to zero. So the parabola needs to include x equals zero and on this graph it doesn't, so that is incorrect. What about the vertex of the parabola? The parabola bit is x plus one squared. That has vertex negative one comma zero. So the vertex would be at x equals negative one and y equals zero. This bit here, it is a parabola on the left. It happens to have its vertex at one comma zero. That was the sort of trick that was thrown in here. This one is wrong, leaving just one choice where the vertex is at negative one zero. The parabola includes the uh, rightmost endpoint and the left bit is the parabola and the right bit is the line.